The Terrapin by Patricia Highsmith Victor heard the elevator door open, his mother's quick footsteps in the hall, and he flipped his book shut. He shoved it under the sofa pillow, out of sight, and winced as he heard it slip between the sofa and wall, and fall to the floor with a thud. Her key was in the lock. Hello, Victor? cried, raising one arm in the air. Her other arm circled a big brown paper bag. Her hand held a cluster of little bags. I have been to my publisher and to the market and also to the fish market. She told him. Why aren't you out playing? It's a lovely, lovely day. I was out, he said, for a little while. I got cold. Ugh. He was unloading the grocery bag in the tiny kitchen of the foyer. You are sick, you know that? In the month of October, you are cold? I see all kinds of children playing on the sidewalk. Even I think that boy you like. What's his name? I don't know, Victor said. His mother wasn't really listening anyway. He pushed his hands into the pockets of his short, two small shorts, making them tighter than ever and walked aimlessly around the living room, looking down at his heavy scuffed shoes. At least his mother had to buy him shoes that fit him, and he rather liked these shoes, because they had the thickest soles of any he had ever owned, and they had heavy toes that rose up a little, like mountain climbers' shoes. Victor paused at the window, and looked straight out at a toast-coloured apartment building across Third Avenue. He and his mother lived on the 18th floor, next to the top floor where the penthouses were. The building across the street was even taller than this one. Victor had liked the Riverside Drive apartment better. He had liked the school he had gone to there better. Here, they laughed at his clothes. In the other school, they had finally got tired of laughing at them. You don't want to go out? asked his mother, coming into the living room, wiping her hands briskly on a paper bag. She sniffed her palms. Ugh, that stink! No, Mama, Victor said patiently. Today is Saturday. I I know. Can you say the days of the week? Of course. Say them. I don't want to say them. I know them. His eyes began to sting around the edges with tears. I've known them for years, years and years. Kids five years old can say the days of the week. But his mother was not listening. She was bending over the drawing table in the corner of the room. She had worked late on something last night. On his sofa bed in the opposite corner of the room, Victor had not been able to sleep until two in the morning when his mother had gone to bed on the studio couch. Come here, Victor. Did you see this? Victor came on dragging feet, hands still in his pockets. No, he hadn't even glanced at her drawing board this morning. He hadn't wanted to. This is Pedro, the little donkey. I invented him last night. What do you think? And this is Miguel, the little Mexican boy who rides him. They ride and ride all over Mexico, and Miguel thinks they are lost, but Pedro knows the way home all the time, and... Victor didn't listen. He deliberately shut his ears in a way that he had learned to do from many years of practice. But boredom, frustration, he knew the word frustration. Had read all about it. Lamped his shoulders, weighed like a stone on his body pressed hatred and tears up to his eyes, as if a volcano were churning in him. He had hoped his mother might take a hint from his saying that he was cold in the silly short shorts. He had hoped his mother might remember what he had told her, that the fellow he had wanted to get acquainted with downstairs, a fellow who looked about his own age, eleven, had laughed at his short pants on Monday afternoon, They make you wear your kid brother's pants or something. 
Victor had drifted away, mortified. What if the fellow knew he didn't even own any longer pants, not even a pair of knickers, much less long pants, even blue jeans? For some, his mother, for some cock-eyed reason, wanted him to look French and made him wear short shorts and stockings that came just below his knees and dopey shirts with round collars. His mother wanted him to stay about six years old, forever, all his life. She liked to test out her drawings on him. Victor is my sounding board. She sometimes said to her friends, I show my drawings to Victor and I know if children will like them. Often Victor said he liked stories when that he did not like or drawings that he was indifferent to because he felt sorry for his mother and because it put her in a better mood if he said he liked them. He was quite tired now of children's books illustrations. If he had ever in his life liked them, he really couldn't remember. And now he had two favourites, Howard Pyle's illustrations and some of Robert Louis Stevenson's books and Cruikshank and Dickens. It was too bad, Victor thought, that he was absolutely the last person to whom his mother should have asked an opinion because he simply hated children's illustrations. And it was a wonder his mother didn't see this because she hadn't sold any illustrations for books for years and years not since Wimple Dimple, a book whose jacket was all torn and turning yellow now from age, which sat in the centre of the bookshelf in a little cleared spot, propped up against the back of the bookcase, so everyone could see it. Victor had been seven years old when that book was printed. His mother liked to tell people, and remind him too, that he had told her what he wanted to see her draw had watched her make every drawing, had shown his opinion by laughing or not, and that she had been absolutely guided by him. Victor doubted this very much, because first of all the story was somebody else's, and had been written before his mother did the drawings, and her drawings had to follow the story, naturally. Since then his mother had done only a few illustrations now and then for magazines for children, how to make paper pumpkins and black paper cats for Halloween and things like that, though she took her portfolio around to publishers all the time. Their income came from his father, who was a wealthy businessman in France, an exporter of perfumes. His mother said he was very wealthy and very handsome, but he had married again, he never wrote, and Victor had no interest in him, didn't even care if he never saw a picture of him, and he never had. His father was French with some Polish, and his mother was Hungarian with some French. The word Hungarian made Victor think of gypsies, but when he had asked his mother once, she had said emphatically that she hadn't any gypsy blood and she had been annoyed that Victor brought the question up. And now she was sounding him out again, poking him in the ribs to make him wake up. As she repeated, Listen to me. Which do you like better, Victor? In all Mexico, there was no burro as wise as Miguel's Pedro. Or, Miguel's Pedro was the wisest burro in all Mexico. I think I like it the first way better. Which way is that? Demanded his mother, thumping her palm down on the illustration. Victor tried to remember the wording, but realised he was only staring at the pencil smudges, the thumbprints on the edges of his mother's illustration board. The coloured drawing in the centre didn't interest him at all. He was not thinking. This was frequent familiar sensation to him now. There was something exciting and important about not thinking. Victor felt, and he thought one day he would find something about it, perhaps under another name, 
in the public library or in the psychology books around the house that he browsed in when his mother was out. Victor, what are you doing? Nothing, Mama. That is exactly it. Nothing. Can you not even think? A warm shame spread through him. It was as if his mother read his thoughts about not thinking. I am thinking, he protested. I'm thinking about not thinking. His tone was defiant. What could she do about it after all? About what? Her black curly head tilted, her mascarid eyes narrowed on him. Not thinking. His mother put her jeweled hand on her hips. Do you know, Victor, you are a little bit strange in the head? She nodded. You are sick. Psychologically sick. And retarded, do you know that? You have the behaviour of a little boy five years old. She said slowly and weightily. It is just as well you spend your Saturdays indoors. Who knows if you would not walk in front of a car, eh? But that is why I love you, little Victor. Put her arm around his shoulders pulled him against her, and for an instant Victor's nose pressed into her large, soft bosom. She was wearing her flesh-coloured dress, the one that you could see through a little where her breast stretched it out. Victor jerked his head away in a confusion of emotions. He did not know if he wanted to laugh or cry. His mother was laughing gaily. Her head back. Think you are? Look at you. My little boy still. Little short pants. Ha ha ha. Now the tears showed in his eyes, he supposed, and his mother acted as if she was enjoying it. Victor turned his head away so she would not see his eyes. Then suddenly he faced her. Do you think I like these pants? You like them, not me. So why do you have to make fun of them? A little boy who's crying. She went on, laughing. Victor made a dash for the bathroom, then swerved away and dove onto the sofa, his face towards the pillows. He shut his eyes tight and opened his mouth, crying but not crying in a way he had learned through practice also. With his mouth open, his throat tight, not breathing for nearly a minute, he could somehow get the satisfaction of crying, screaming even, without anybody knowing it. He pushed his nose, his open mouth, his teeth against the tomato red soft pillow, and though his mother's voice went on in a lazily mocking tone and her laughter went on, he imagined that he was getting fainter and more distant from her. He imagined, rigid in every muscle, that he was suffering the absolute worst that any human being could suffer. He imagined that he was dying. But he did not think of death as an escape, only as a concentrated and painful incident. This was the climax of his not crying. Then he breathed again, and his mother's voice intruded. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Mrs. Badzerkian is coming for tea. I want you to wash your face and put on a clean shirt. I want you to decide something for her. Now what are you going to decide? In winter when I go to bed, said Victor. She was making him memorise every poem in A Child's Garden of Verses. He had said the first one that came into his head, and now there was an argument, because he had recited that one the last time. I, I said it because I couldn't think of any other one right off the bat, Victor shouted. Don't yell at me! His mother cried, storming across the room at him. She slapped his face before he knew what was happening. He was up on one elbow on the sofa, 
on his back, his long, knobby-kneed legs splayed out in front of him. All right, he thought, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. He looked up at her with loathing. Would not show the slap had hurt, that it still stung. No more tears for, tears for today, he swore. No more even not crying. He would finish the day, go through the tea like a stone, like a soldier, not wincing. His mother paced around the room, turning one of her rings round and round, glancing at him from time to time, looking quickly away from him, but his eyes were steady on her. He was not afraid. She could even slap him again, and he wouldn't care. At last she announced that she was going to wash her hair, and she went into the bathroom. But Victor got up from the sofa and wandered across the room. He wished he had a room of his own to go to. In the apartment on Riverside Drive, there had been three living rooms. A living room, and his and his mother's rooms. When she was in the living room, he had been able to go into his bedroom and vice versa. But here, they were going to tear down the old building they had lived in on Riverside Drive. It was not a pleasant thing for Victor to think about, suddenly remembering the book that had fallen. He pulled out the sofa and reached. Benninger's The Human Mind, full of fascinating case histories, Victor put it back on the bookshelf between an astrology book and how to draw. His mother did not like him to read psychology books, but Victor loved them, especially the ones with case histories in them. The people in the case histories did what they wanted to do. They were natural. Nobody bossed them. At the local branch library, he spent hours browsing through the psychology shelves. They were in the adult section, but the librarian did not mind his sitting at the tables there, because he was quiet. Victor went into the kitchen and got a glass of water. As he was standing there drinking it, he heard a scratching noise coming from one of the paper bags on the counter. Mouse, he thought. But when he moved a couple of the bags, he didn't see any mouse. The scratching was coming from inside one of the bags. Gingerly, he opened the bag with his fingers and waited for something to jump out. Looking in, he saw a white paper carton. He pulled it out slowly. The bottom was damp. It opened like a pastry box. Victor jumped in surprise. It was a turtle on its back. A live turtle. It was wriggling its legs in the air, trying to turn over. Moistened his lips and, frowning with concentration, took the turtle by its sides with both hands, turned him over and let him gently into the box again. The turtle drew in its feet then, and its head stretched up a little and looked straight at him. Victor smiled. Hadn't his mother told him she'd bought him a present? A live turtle! Victor's eyes glazed with anticipation as he thought of taking the turtle down, maybe with a leash around its neck, to show the fellow who laughed at his short pants. He might change his mind about being friends with him if he found out he owned a turtle. Hey, Mama, Mama! Victor yelled at the bathroom door. Brought me a turtle? A what? The water shut off. A turtle! In the kitchen, Victor had been jumping up and down in the hall. He stopped. His mother had hesitated too. The water came on again, and she said in a shrill tone, Get un terrapin! Pour on ragu! Victor understood. And a small chill went over him because his mother had spoken in French and his mother addressed him in French when she was giving him an order that had to be obeyed or when she anticipated resistance from him. So, the terrapin was for a stew. Victor nodded to himself with a stunned resignation and went back to the kitchen. For a stew. Well, terrapin was not long for this world, as they say a terrapin like to eat? Lettuce. 
raw bacon, boiled potato. Victor peered into the refrigerator. He held a piece of lettuce near the terrapin's horny mouth. The terrapin did not open its mouth, but it looked at him. Victor held the lettuce near the two little dots of its nostrils, but if the terrapin smelled it, it showed no interest. Victor looked under the sink and pulled out a large wash pan. He put two inches of water into it, then he gently dumped the terrapin into the pan. The terrapin paddled for a few seconds, as if it had to swim. Then, finding that its stomach sat in the bottom of the pan, it stopped and drew his fear. Victor got down on his knees and studied the terrapin's face. Its upper lip overhung the lower, giving it a rather stubborn and unfriendly expression, but its eyes were bright and shining. Victor smiled when he looked hard at them. Okay, Monsieur Terrapin, he said. Just tell me what you would like to eat and we'll get it for you. Maybe some tuna? They had had tuna fish salad yesterday for dinner and there was a small bowl of it left over. Victor got a little chunk of it on his fingers and presented it to the terrapin. The terrapin was not interested. Victor looked around the kitchen, wondering. Then, seeing the sunlight in the floor of the living room, he picked up the pan and carried it to the living room and set it down so the sunlight would fall on the terrapin's back. All turtles liked sunlight, Victor thought. He lay down on the floor on his side, propped up on an elbow. The terrapin stared at him for a moment, then very slowly, and with an air of forethought and caution, put out its legs and advanced, bound the circular boundary of the pan, and moved to the right, half its body out of the shallow water. It wanted out. Victor took it in one hand by the sides and said, You can come out and have a little walk. He smiled as the terrapin started to disappear under the sofa. He caught it easily because it moved so slowly. When he put it down on the carpet, it was quite still, as if it had withdrawn a little to think what it should do next, where it should go. It was a brownish green looking at it. Victor thought of river bottoms, or river water flowing, or maybe oceans. Where did terrapins come from? He jumped up and went to the dictionary on the bookshelf. The dictionary had a picture of a terrapin, but it was a dull black and white drawing, not so pretty as the live one. He learned nothing, except that the name was of Algonquian origin, that the terrapin lived in fresh or barrackish water, and that it was edible. Edible. That was bad luck, Victor thought, but he was not going to eat any terrapin tonight. It would be all for his mother, that ragu, and even if she slapped him and made him learn an extra two or three poems, he would not eat any terrapin tonight. His mother came out of the bathroom. What are you doing there, Victor? Victor put the dictionary back in the shelf. His mother had seen the pan. I'm looking at the terrapin, he said, then realised the terrapin had disappeared. He got down on his hands and knees and looked under the sofa. Don't put him on the furniture. He makes spots. Said his mother. She was standing in the foyer, rubbing her hair vigorously with a towel. Victor found the terrapin between the wastebasket and the wall. He put him back in the pan. Have you changed your shirt? Asked his mother. Victor changed his shirt. Then, at his mother's order, sat down on the sofa with a children's garden of verses and tackled another poem, a brand new one, for Mrs. Badzerkian. He learned two lines at a time reading it aloud in a soft voice to himself, then repeating it, then putting two, four and six lines together until he had the whole thing. He recited it to the terrapin. Then Victor asked his mother if he could go play with the terrapin in the bathtub. 
snow and get your shirt all splashed? I can put on my other shirt. No, it's nearly four o'clock now. Get the pan out of the living room. Victor carried the pan back to the kitchen. His mother took the terrapin quite fearlessly out of the pan, put it back into the white paper box close to its lid and stuck the box in the refrigerator. Jumped a little as the refrigerator door slammed. It would be awfully cold in there for the terrapin, but then he supposed fresh or brackish water was cold now and then too. Victor, cut the lemon said his mother. She was preparing the big round tray with cups and saucers. The water was boiling in the kettle. Mrs. Budzerkin was prompt, as usual, and his mother poured the tea as soon as she had deposited her coat and pocketbook on the foyer chair and sat down. Mrs. Budzerkin smelled of clothes. She had a small straight mouth and a thin moustache on her upper lip, which fascinated Victor as he had never seen one on a woman before. Not one at such short range, anyway. He had never mentioned Mrs. Budzerkin's moustache to his mother, knowing it was considered ugly, but in a strange way her moustache was the thing that he liked best about her. The rest of her was dull, uninteresting, and vaguely unfriendly. She always pretended to listen carefully to his poetry recitals, but he felt that she fidgeted thought of other things when he spoke, and was glad when it was all over. Today Victor recited very well, without any hesitation, standing in the middle of the living room and facing the two women, who were then having their second cups of tea. Play bien, said his mother. Now you may have a cookie. Victor chose from a plate of small round cookie with a drop of orange goo in its centre. He kept his knees close together when he sat down. He always felt Mrs. Budzerke and looked at his knees and with distaste. He often wished she would make some remark to his mother about his being old enough for long pants. But she never had, and at least not without within his hearing. Victor learned from his mother's conversation with Mrs. Budzerkin that the Lorenzes were coming for dinner tomorrow evening. It was probably for them that the terrapin stew was going to be made. Victor was glad that he would have the terrapin one more day to play with. Tomorrow morning, he thought, he would ask his mother if he could take the terrapin down onto the sidewalk for a while, either on a leash or in the paper box, if his mother insisted. Like a child, his mother was saying, laughing with a glance at him, and Mrs. Badzerkin smiled shrewdly at him with her small, tight mouth. Victor had been excused and was sitting across the room with a book on the studio couch. His mother was telling Mrs. Badzerkin how he had played with the terrapin. Victor frowned down at his book, pretending not to hear. His mother did not like him to open his mouth to her or her guests once he had been excused. But now she was calling him her... Little baby Victor. He stood up with his finger in the place of his book. I don't see why it's childish to look at a terrapin, he said, flushing with a sudden anger. They're very interesting animals. They... His mother interrupted him with a laugh. But at once the laugh disappeared, and she said sternly, Victor, I thought I had excused you. Isn't that correct? He hesitated, seeing in a flash the scene that was going to take place when Mrs. Bedzerkin had left. Yes, Mama, I'm sorry, he said, and then he sat down and bent over his book again. Twenty minutes later, Mrs. Bedzerkin left. His mother scolded him for being rude, but it was not a five or ten minute scolding of the kind he had expected. It lasted hardly two minutes. She had forgotten to buy heavy cream and she wanted Victor to go downstairs and get some. Victor put on his grey woolen jacket and went out. He always felt embarrassed and conspicuous in the jacket because it came just a little bit below his short pants and he looked as if he had nothing on under the coat. Victor looked round for Frank on the sidewalk, 
but he didn't see him. He crossed Third Avenue and went to a delicatessen in the big building that he could see from the living room window. On his way back, he saw Frank walking along the sidewalk, bouncing a ball. Now, Victor went right up to him. Hey, Victor said, I've got a terrapin upstairs. A what? Frank caught the ball and stopped. A terrapin, you know, like a turtle. I'll bring him down tomorrow morning and show you, if you're around. He's pretty big. Yeah? Why don't you bring him down now? Oh, we're, because we're going to eat now, said Victor. See ya. He went into his building. Well, he had achieved something. Frank had looked really interested. Victor wished he could bring the terrapin down now, but his mother never liked him to go out after dark, and it was practically dark now. When Victor got upstairs, his mother was still in the kitchen. Eggs were boiling, and she had put a big pot of water on the back burner. You took him out again, Victor said, seeing the terrapin's box on the counter. Yes, I prepare the stew tonight, said his mother. That is why I need the cream. Victor looked at her. You're going to... You have to kill it tonight. Yes, my little one, tonight. She jiggled the pot of eggs. Mama, can I take him downstairs to show Frank? Victor asked quickly. Just for five minutes, Mama. Frank's down there now. Who is Frank? He's that fellow you asked me about today. The blonde fellow we always see. Please, Mama. His mother's black eyebrows frowned. Take the terrapin downstairs? Certainly not. Don't be absurd, my baby. The terrapin is not a toy. Victor tried to think of some other lever of persuasion. He had not removed his coat. You wanted me to get acquainted with Frank. Yes. What has that got to do with a terrapin? The water on the back burner began to boil. You see, I, I promised him a... Victor watched his mother lift the terrapin from the box and as she dropped it into the boiling water, his mouth fell open. Mama! What is this? What is this noise? Victor, open-mouthed, stared at the terrapin whose legs were now racing against the steep sides of the pot. The terrapin's mouth opened. It looked directly at Victor for an instant. Its head arched back in torture. The open mouth sank beneath the seething water. That was the end. Her blinked. So, saw the four legs and the tail stretched out in the water. Its head. He looked at his mother. Drying her hands in a towel, she glanced at him, then said, Ugh! She smelled of her hands, then hung the towel back. Did you have to kill him like that? How else? The same way you kill a lobster? Don't you know that? It does not hurt them. He stared at her. When she started to touch him, he stepped back. He thought of the terrapin's wide mouth, and his eyes suddenly flooded with tears. Maybe the terrapin had been screaming, and it hadn't been heard over the bubbling of the water. The terrapin had looked at him, wanting him to pull him out, he hadn't moved to help him. His mother had tricked him, done it so fast, he couldn't save him. Step back again. No, don't touch me. His mother slapped his face hard and quickly. Victor set his jaw. Then he about faced and went to the closet and threw his jacket onto a hanger and hung it up. He went into the living room and fell down on the sofa. He was not crying now but his mouth opened against the sofa pillow. Then he remembered the terrapin's mouth, and he closed his lips. The terrapin had suffered, otherwise it would not have moved its legs so terribly fast to get out. Then he wept, soundlessly as a terrapin, his mouth open. He put both hands over his face, so as not to wet the sofa. After a long while, he got up. In the kitchen, his mother was humming, and every few minutes he heard her quick, firm steps as she went about her work. Victor had set his teeth again. He walked slowly to the kitchen doorway. 
The terrapin was out on the wooden chopping board and his mother, after a glance at him, still humming, took a knife and bore down his blade, cutting off the terrapin's little nails. Victor half closed his eyes, but he watched steadily. The nails, the bits of skin attached to them, his mother scooped off the board into her palm and dumped in the garbage bag. Then she turned the terrapin on its back and with the same sharp pointed knife, she began to cut away at the pale bottom shell. The terrapin's neck was bent sideways. Victor wanted to look away, but still he stared. Now the terrapin's insides were all exposed, red and white and greenish. Victor did not listen to what his mother was saying about cooking terrapins in Europe before he was born. Her voice was gentle and soothing, not at all like what she was. All right, don't look at me like that. She suddenly threw at him, stomping her foot. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? Yes, I think so. You are sick, you know that? Victor could not touch any of his supper, and his mother couldn't force him to, even though she shook him by the shoulders and threatened to slap him. They had cream chipped beef on toast. Victor did not say a word. He felt very remote from his mother, and when she screamed right into his face, even He even felt very odd, the way he did sometimes when he was sick at his stomach. But he was not sick at his stomach. When they went to bed, he felt afraid of the dark. He saw the terrapin's face very large, its mouth open, its eyes wide and full of pain. Victor wished he could walk out the window and float, go anywhere he wanted to, disappear, yet be everywhere. He imagined his mother's hands on his shoulders jerking him back if he tried to step out the window. He got up and went quietly into the kitchen. The kitchen was absolutely dark and there was no window but he put his hand accurately on the knife rack and felt gently, gently for the knife he wanted. He thought of the terrapin and little pieces now all mixed up in the sauce of cream and egg yolks and sherry in the pot under the Mother's cry was not silent. It seemed to tear his ears off. His second blow was in her body. And then he stabbed her in the throat again. Only tiredness made him stop. And by then people were trying to bump the door in. Victor at last walked to the door pulled the chain bolt back and opened it for them. He was taken to a large, old building full of nurses and doctors. Victor was very quiet and did everything he was asked to do and answered the questions they put to him, but only those questions. And since they didn't ask him anything about a terrapin, he did not bring it up 